so I'm going to talk to you about how to play the VC game. Uh, but before I do that, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I know everyone here can read, but you're probably looking at Twitter, so I'll read it out to you. Uh, my name is Seath Artelli. I'm with Dowdy Hanson Technology Ventures. Uh, those are our Twitter handles. I encourage you to follow. We're pretty active, and we tweet a lot. Interesting stuff. Um, American, but I'm based in the UK. I have been a VC for about five years. So I started out as an analyst. I'm now a, a principal or an investment manager, as Bogdan said. Um, and I look at pan-European consumer internet and mobile companies. So as a firm, we've invested in over 30 companies. Uh, we do everything from uh, clean tech to software as a service, uh, as well as web and mobile uh, consumer startups. I focus mostly on the consumer stuff. So these are the four companies I work with the most. Uh, as Bogdan mentioned, we are one of the early investors in SoundCloud. So that's a Berlin-based audio platform. It's the largest audio platform uh, in the world. Handmade Mobile, which is a mobile dating and flirting site, also based in the UK. Uh, Mega Zebra, which is based uh, in uh, Munich and is a social games developer. And then Seedcamp, uh, which is a pan-European accelerator program, also based in the UK. So the first three companies I'm on the board of, and the last one I'm uh, very active with. So I mentor a lot at Seedcamp events and also participate in their investment committees. So I'm going to talk to you about fundraising. Uh, but before I do that, I want to talk to you about games. I like to play games. I play a lot of different games. I play board games. I play video games social games, casual games, all kinds of games. Most people I know like to play games. Most entrepreneurs I know like to play one type of game or another. But no entrepreneur I know really likes fundraising. They find it either terrifying or painful, or both. Uh, but actually, fundraising and playing games uh, have a lot in common. They're very similar. So I'm going to talk about some of the char characteristics of gaming that also apply to fundraising. Uh, but before we do that, uh, we have to talk about what kind of game fundraising is. Is it a game of chance or a game of strategy? And it's actually both. It's a combination. So definitely focusing on your strategy, improving your skill level, improves your odds of successfully raising money. Uh, but there's definitely luck involved. You know, if uh, Facebook announces something that's hugely beneficial to your company, uh, just the day you, announce you start fundraising, it's pretty good luck. If your biggest competitor raises a massive round and scares the crap out of all the VCs you're going to talk to, it's bad luck. But you can't control your luck, although I know a lot of entrepreneurs who try to. Uh, but you can work on your strategy. So I'm going to talk to you about some of the strategies you can employ uh, to improve your odds of successfully raising money. So first and foremost, fundraising is a social game. So like other social games, you spend hours and hours and hours doing really pointless tasks. And at the end of it, you think, God, that was a waste of time. <laughs> uh, but it's also social in the sense that the more people you know playing the same game as you improves your odds. So you have to work on your network. And this doesn't just mean knowing other VCs, actually. What it means is you have to know all the people that VCs talk to angel investors, other entrepreneurs, both active and not, uh, business development people at big companies like Microsoft and Facebook that work with startups. These are the people that VCs talk to a lot, and it's people that they listen to. So I get lots of deals every single day. Um, I get deals in my inbox. I get deals via Twitter. I get a lot of deals. And a lot of them are, most of them actually, are from people I've never met. And so I don't have a frame of reference. I don't have anything to judge the company by other than the email. And email is a really horrible way to present yourself. There's no tone in email. It's really hard to make an impact via email. And a business plan is even worse. But if someone I know, someone in my network, introduces me to a deal, someone that I trust, I am much more likely to look at that deal than I am to others for no other reason than it's someone I know and I don't want to ignore them. So, but also because that person is a filter. And filters are very, very important for VCs. There are just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of companies out there. And without filters, it's really hard to tell one from the other. So a network is one kind of filter that a VC employs. So key takeaway, 
definitely work on your network. If you're just starting off fundraising or you know you're going to be fundraising and you don't have much of a network, you need to start building one. And if you already have a network, keep working on it. It's something that just never ends. So always, always work on your network. Okay, viral loops. Uh, if you play social games, you'll be very familiar with the concept of viral loops. In a social game, there is a moment, several moments, at which you're encouraged to share. Either you got a high score, or you uh, want to build your virtual farm, whatever it is, you're encouraged to share, and all your friends on the same network as you will see that. And when they see it, some percentage of them will click on the, on the little activity, and they will start playing the social game. That's how Cityville empires are built. The VC world is very similar. So I hear someone talking about a company. Lots of people are talking about a company. There's a very good chance I'm going to want to meet that company. Creating a buzz around your company is one of, one of the best ways of getting a meeting. The fact is VCs are pack animals. They like to know what everyone's talking about and they like, to be, they like to be in the conversation. So if, if there's a company that no one is talking about and they meet with them, it's not nearly as good as, as if, if everyone's talking about them. And it's you know, for a really simple reason. Uh, they don't like to be left out, but more importantly, they want social proof. They want to know that what they're looking at is also stuff that other people find interesting. So having social proof is just a, f a fundamental way of judging whether a company is good or not. You may not like the mentality, but it's a pretty basic human trait. It doesn't just apply to uh, VCs and fundraising. They're not alone in this. Most people want social proof. So it's not easy to build a buzz around your company, but this is where your network can get very valuable. So that's one way of building buzz. There's another way, though. And it's badges. So what is the startup equivalent of a badge? Well, I actually think it's accelerator programs, like SeedCamp. So uh, if you guys don't know SeedCamp, it's a pan-European accelerator program. We're an investor in it. Uh, we're very, very active uh, in the SeedCamp program. So we go to all the mini seed camps. We, we always look at companies that have come through the program. Um, but there are others out there. There's Springboard, which is also based in the UK. I'm sure there must be some here in, in Romania as well. Um, there's local ones, there's pan-European ones. Uh, Hack Forward, who I believe someone will be speaking tomorrow, uh, is another one in Germany. They all have you know, different qualities to them. Some of them are very well known, and they're sort of a, a badge of approval. I think the best ones can, can really work to accelerate uh, your progress as a company, both in fundraising and not. In fact, the only two Romanian companies I know are Brainiant and Uberview, and both of them came through SeedCamp. So, you know, it works. Um, and it works for a good reason, because they address, you know, sometimes geographies that just wouldn't be able to address on my own. And, you know, VCs have limited time. We have five people in our fund who invest, thousands of companies, lots and lots of countries to look at, some geographies we just can't get to. And so going through an accelerator program is a really good way of, of jump-starting that process. Okay, heads-up display. That's what a HUD is. If you play video games, you know that when you're playing, you have all these stats around you that tell you how well you're doing. They tell you about your health, the weapons you have, etc. With a startup, you have something similar. You have your metrics. Make sure your metrics are going in the right direction. If you've launched, if you haven't launched, this isn't relevant. But if you've launched and you're not growing, I wouldn't bother talking to VCs for fundraising. You should talk to them to build a relationship, but I wouldn't bother trying to raise money because it's probably not going to happen. If your growth is flat, it means you probably haven't hit product market fit yet. So they're really, and, and that's what most VCs look for. They look for companies that are growing, they're growing uh, fast, and they, you know, they scale very, very quickly. If you don't have those characteristics, it's unlikely that you're going to be successful in raising uh, venture capital money. Know your gamer. I'm not sure what game the woman on the left is playing, but I'm almost entirely sure it's not Gears of War. Different people play different games, and VCs are the same. VCs have areas of expertise. 
So if you have an infrastructure software company, you could talk to me about it for three hours, and I would have absolutely no idea what you do, really. If you built a social game about network infrastructure, I'll understand it in 30 seconds. But, and, and I think this is, this is sort of a problem in the VC world, because oftentimes when you meet with a VC, they'll, they'll tell you if it's not their area or not. But a lot of the times they won't. So you'll be talking to a VC who actually has no idea what you do. But they won't tell you because they don't want to admit that they don't know. And they'll pass judgment on your company. They have absolutely no problem saying, I, this is bad. Even though they don't know actually what you do or understand what you do. So make sure that the person you're talking to is the right person in the fund. There's, you know, most VCs have, most VC funds have several partners. They usually have different areas of expertise. So if you're talking to someone where what you're doing is not their area of expertise, ask for an intro to the right person at that fund or go out and find that person yourself. Okay, practice. Just like in gaming, the more you practice, the better off you get. This is no different. Practice, practice, practice. You know, get your elevator pitch down. You should be able to explain what you do in 30 seconds, three minutes, and 30 minutes. Talk to everyone in your network. Talk to people from all different parts of the ecosystem. Explain what your company does. I guarantee you, you'll start seeing patterns in the questions they ask. Those are the most likely questions you're gonna get when you talk to a VC. Make sure you can answer them effectively. The questions may be about product or marketing. They may be about the business model or the financial plan. You'll get questions from all different angles because VCs have different areas that they're comfortable with. For example, I talk a lot about product. I'm a product person, so I really like to view things from a product perspective. I also look at marketing and distribution channels and, ten and business models. I tend not to look as much, for example, about, uh, let's say, sales, because that's just not an area that, that I have as much expertise in. But there'll be another person uh, at, at our team that uh, will definitely talk to you about sales. So you're gonna get questions from every angle. And even though you may be more comfortable in some areas than others, you're gonna have to answer all the questions. So make sure you, you pitch your company to all different kinds of people before you meet with the VCs and know what the likely questions are. Okay? Now, let's say you do all of this. You practice, your numbers are going in the right direction, you network, you get your intros, and you meet with me. Let's say you meet with me and I get it. I get you, I get your company, I buy into the vision, I'm totally on board. And I'll tell you, okay, it's really good, I talked to my team about it, they really like it, now I want you to come in and meet the team. If you play a lot of video games, you're gonna recognize this moment. This is the boss level. When you go in to meet with a VC partnership, this isn't what a VC partnership looks like, but it is what it feels like. You're gonna be talking to a room full of people, probably wearing suits, but maybe not, uh, that know something about your company, but maybe not as much as the person that you've been speaking to. So you're gonna have to explain everything again and you're gonna have an hour to do it. Actually, you'll probably have 30 minutes to do it because there'll be lots and lots of questions. So the number one thing you can do is be prepared. And I think it's the responsibility of the person who asked you to come in to prepare you. So every time I meet with a company that I really like and I wanna invest in and I ask them to come in, the first thing I do is prepare them. So I go through their pitch deck and I help them get it down to about 10 slides, really focusing on the stuff that I know we like to look at. Uh, and then I tell them about the team. I give them the background of every person they're gonna meet, what their areas of ex expertise are, what kind of questions they ask, everything. And I think when you go in for the boss level of fundraising, you should do the same. So you should ask the person that's your strongest relationship, your deal champion, everything you can about who you're gonna meet. So everything I just talked about is the pretty traditional way of fundraising. So it's sort of bombing the field, if you will. It's a numbers game. The more VCs you meet with, the higher probability you will actually get fundraising because you talk to a lot of people, maybe someone will you know, bite the hook. Sort of like 
casting a net in fishing. Uh, but there's another way, and it's a little more strategic. It's sniping the VC. So you have to target the VCs that are most likely to invest in your company. Now, how do you know the VCs that are most likely to invest in your company? Well, when VCs think about entrepreneurs, they usually think about them in three buckets. There's the successful ones that have had a bunch of you know, companies and, and been very good at it. They're the ones who have never done it before, the first time entrepreneur, and then they're the ones that lose money. Most entrepreneurs lose money, some are very successful, and then there's some that have, have, haven't had a chance yet to fail. What they don't talk about, but what is true, is that VCs fall into the exact same three buckets. There are successful VCs, there are new VCs, and then there are the ones that have lost money. There's a few in the first bucket, there's a few more in the second bucket, and there's a lot in the third bucket. And the third bucket is the hardest one to raise money from. So, and it's for a good reason. You know, if you invest in companies time and time again, and every time a VC invests in a company, it's supposed to be successful, right? You never invest in a company and think this will fail. You, want, you know it's gonna be successful. You know it, and then it fails. Again, and again, and again, and again. And it's kind of hard to stay optimistic. In fact, it's quite easy to become very skeptical. And so you'll meet a lot of VCs that are very skeptical because time and time again, they've invested in companies and they haven't seen success. And you start believing that maybe it's not possible. Not every VC is like this, but a lot are. And it's, it's you know, a pretty human thing. Um, so the ones that aren't like that, usually, are the ones that either have made money in the past, so they know it's possible, or the ones who haven't yet had a chance to fail. Um, I used to be in the, in the second bucket, so I was a new VC, which is why one of the first investments I did is this company, SoundCloud. And at the time, SoundCloud was actually kind of a crazy idea. So they had a co creator-focused collaboration network. They had about 50,000 users, so they were pretty small. But their vision was huge. So their vision was to build, you know, this huge, actually now it's to build a huge audio platform. But even back then it was slightly different, but it was still a really big vision. And a lot of people just thought it, it wouldn't happen. It was also about four months after the financial crisis, the last financial crisis. So most people were really scared the world was gonna end. So people were scared and they didn't believe it could happen. And I think I was just in a lucky position because I was really naive. I was basically too dumb to know that actually most of the time these kinds of companies fail. And so I made a bet. And I think the fact that I was quite naive about it actually worked uh, in our favor because I didn't know that you know, most of these big visions fail. Um, by the way, I don't think the founders, uh, Alex and Eric, actually knew that at the time. I think they just got lucky. Um, but, but it worked. You know, they'd been out fundraising for, for a long time, and most of the people they met uh, either passed or, or were you know, being quite slow because they just they didn't believe that it, that it could happen. So you know, it, it, it worked to their advantage. And I think you could do the same. So if you're raising money for your company, you go out and you find either the very successful VCs, and it's not hard to figure out who they are, or the ones that are new, the ones that are trying to make their name, the ones who are still really optimistic. And you, you very highly target your fundraising approach. Okay, a couple of more quick ones. Always, always, always do your homework. You know, when you play a game, you can get the cheat codes, right? You look online and you can figure out how to progress in the game faster. Fundraising is the same way. There are a lot of cheat codes out there. The number of times I meet with an entrepreneur who hasn't done any work at all still amazes me. But you can go to websites. Venture Hacks is an excellent one, and they have a list of resources that will point you even further. Um, books, blogs, you know, uh, newspaper articles, everything you can do. Educate yourself. Uh, I think there is no reason why, and I still get it, but I don't think there's a reason why I should still have entrepreneurs come to me and ask me to sign an NDA. VCs don't sign NDAs. They're just bad, so don't start off that way. It's a really bad way to, when I get that, I just think this person doesn't really know what they're doing. There's no reason you should get screwed on legals. There's a lot of information out there about the legal process, what all the terms in a, in a term sheet are, 
what all the terms in a contract between a VC and entrepreneur are. There's no reason you should, you should get screwed by any of this, but you have to do your homework. So definitely have to do your homework. Okay, and the final one is you will probably lose. You will get a lot of no's. Lots and lots of people will turn you down when you go to them to raise money. Don't let it discourage you. I think this is probably one of the biggest problems in Europe is people give up too easily. You have to be relentless. Both of the companies that we invested in, that, uh, that I've uh, invested in, uh, both Megazebra and SoundCloud went through this. SoundCloud got lots and lots and lots of no's before they got a yes or they got a maybe, which is kind of like a no, but VCs don't like to say no, so they say maybe. It's a no. They got a lot of them, but they were relentless. I mean, they are endlessly optimistic guys, which I think you have to be to be an entrepreneur, and they were relentless. They didn't take no for an answer. So they, they kept at it, and they ended up being quite successful. And good thing they did, because they're now doing incredibly well. Megazebra was the same way. We actually said no to Megazebra, I think twice, before we said yes. And they made a lot of progress between the no's and after the no's. You know, their numbers were in the right direction. They made really, really good progress on some of their games. And, you know, the second or third time, uh, we said yes. And so they were, you know, one, they obviously had the right core thing, which is the product and the metrics. But more importantly, they didn't give up. And I would encourage you not to do, to do the same. So it can be extremely, extremely discouraging when you go out fundraising. It is. It is a painful thing, and it's very disheartening. Uh, but you have to kind of stay optimistic and keep going. So you have to insert another quarter or a, a, a lay, lee, lay, um, and just just play again. So keep at it. Uh, I didn't actually have anything else, and I think I'm over on my time. So any other questions? Thank you first. Mm -hmm. First of all, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Questions for Sitar? Can I ask you some questions? Mm -hmm. uh, what's like the most, the key aspect that you're looking on when you evaluate a startup? Me personally or yes. VCs? No, me no, personally, you uh, personally? I am product focused. So I look at product. So whether the company's pre launch or post launch, I look at the product that they've built. And I know, because I look at very early, I look at companies quite early, I know that the product that they have isn't the ultimate product, but I think looking at a product tells you a lot about the founders. And the founders at their early stage is what we invest in. So looking at the product, seeing how they design, seeing how it works, it tells me a lot about how the founders think about product, about people, about user experience, and about consumers. Uh, so that's what I look at. And then, but the real answer is the founders. Obviously, so me with the founders, you know, are they relentless? Are they optimistic? Are they product focused? Because I think, especially for web companies that are in the consumer space and mobile companies, you know, product is the core. If you don't have product in your DNA, it's going to be really, really hard to build a company. We have one question over there and one over here, and I think one more there. Yes. Hi, my name is Peter from greencolab.com. Uh, my question is, what is the right answer if a VC asks you, okay, your product is great, what will you do if Facebook or Google will do the same? <laughs> uh, VCs love to ask that question, actually. I think it's an awful question to ask. Um, you know, in, in my experience, it's usually not Facebook and Google you should be worried about, it's other startups. Uh, and I think that's actually an appropriate answer. So you would tell them, look, we're not worried about Facebook and Google because this isn't what they do. They aren't focusing on this 100%. We are. But we know other startups that are, and that's who we're worried about. But always with big companies, it's a side project, it's a skunk project. It's not the core of their business. And I think not having it be the core of their business is usually why a lot of these side products fail. Whereas for your company, what you do, it's the core of it. You're focusing 100% all your energy. You're thinking day and night about just this. I think that's a huge differentiator between the large companies and the startups. You would accept this answer if you would get it? I would, yeah. But I, I don't ask the question, so. Okay. <laughs> Probably the wrong person. I mean, I, I never ask that question because I think 
the, wh when I do get more nervous is when someone attacks Facebook directly. So you do something that is what Facebook is already doing very well, then I think it's a valid question. So, but if it's, I, I, I really just never ask a question of what would, you know, what if Facebook do this or Google do this? Because in my experience, it's usually not Facebook and Google you have to worry about, it's other startups. Thank you very much. Okay, next one. This one. We have one here also. Uh. Hi, uh, Georgios Gatos from Greece. Um, question, we see lots of times, especially in the Balkans, Eastern European countries, that we have lots of Me Too um, startups. Mm -hmm. And I'm not talking about you know, a group on clone, I'm mm -hmm. talking about an area where uh, it's the race is not over yet. Let's go to mobile, for example, mm -hmm. and you have some startups based in Silicon Valley that they got funded, and mm -hmm. you come up with a similar idea in another uh, mm -hmm. side of the Atlantic, and you go to a VC and they say, well, it's okay, I can see you have a twist on that, but they already raised two million uh, dollars. Mm -hmm. What's your opinion on that? Do they stop or they keep going? My, my personal opinion is I don't think money makes a huge difference in terms of success. Um, raising a lot of money gives you options, but it doesn't actually in any way guarantee success. So, I, you know, I, we were recently looking at a company that was a competitor to B, uh, Air, Airbnb. And everyone was really scared because Airbnb raised $100 million. And I just don't think it matters. I don't think the amount of money another company has matters. Because if that mattered, then Facebook and Google should matter. But they don't. So it's not money, I think, that makes a big difference in the success of a startup. Uh, I do think it's, it's helpful to have enough to get to the next milestone, but I wouldn't stop just for that. Yeah. Um, hi. Given everything you know now, several years later, would you make uh, an investment in SoundCloud again? Oh. Yeah, of course. No, but if they come now with the pitch uh, with which they came to you back in, you know, whenever they came, 2008? Uh, yeah, it was uh, like January 2009, and, and I would. And I think, I, I didn't talk about this in here, but I think the, w what they did really well was, well, one, they're highly investable people, but in the, the presentation they had at the time, uh, was excellent because there was one slide which was just sort of the big vision slide. And if you bought into that slide, then I think you bought into the entire vision of SoundCloud. Um, and, and, and they did it really well. I see far too often pitch decks that are just really, I don't know quite how to explain it, but they don't have a vision. There isn't a vision. They, they probably have a vision in the company, but it's not really translated into, into the slide. And I don't think having more slides matters. I mean, they had the time, too many, it was like 20. But the last time they, they did a fundraising round, when they, they just raised money last year from uh, Union Square and Index, and he had six slides. And there was a slide there that, that, that really communicated it. And I think it's, it's that that, you, that we need, you need to buy into. And if they came to me now, I think, yeah, it'd be the same thing. They were quite lucky because I had looked at music for about two or three years, so I knew this space very well. Um, and if someone came to me now, uh, with music, I would, I would probably do the same thing. You know, it, would, it would be an area that I know really well, so I'd be able to, to suss it pretty well. Thank you. So we don't have any more questions, but I'm curious and I have <laughs> to ask you, uh, what was the key slide in SoundCloud's presentation? The first one, when, 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 yeah. when I first saw them. So they had this slide that was, you have all these different places to, you have, so there's SoundCloud in the middle, and you had all these different ways to create music. So you had all the different like creation software things. That was on the left side. And the right side was all the ways you could, you could find music. So it was all the consumer discovery points. And the, the vision was to become the largest distribution platform uh, for music at the time uh, on the web. They've now become the largest audio distribution platform. But vision was to be in the middle of the creation and the consumption of music. And in that process, you capture all of the data of where people are listening to what music, which network, 
which discovery mechanism works the best, et cetera. It's a huge problem for people that make music, distributing all of this stuff, um, but it's also a very valuable problem to solve because you get all of the data on consumption patterns, et cetera.